right, praise God. Amen. We are live. What am I looking at? Okay. All right, good evening. This is uh, Bernardine Wormley Daniels and the Living Water live stream Bible study. Praise God. Um, good evening to Sabrina. We're going to give people a minute to log on. Praise God. I was running around, so I was a come came on a few minutes late because I was running around trying to find my sinus. I got a sinus headache and I feel it coming on. I was like, no, don't come on now. I got to focus. And I couldn't find my drugs. So <laughs> we'll see how far I get tonight because I got a headache. All right, so good evening, Kathy. Good evening, Catherine. Good evening, Heidi and Sherry. And my cousin, Mary, and my aunt, Mary. Praise God for them. Good evening, Pastor Susan. My friends from Mississippi. Praise God, I'm going to be in Mississippi again in... Um, Oh, March, I think the beginning of March, I'm going to be in, where am I going to be? Laurel, Mississippi. Praise God. Uh, good evening to my friend Jacintha across the um, bridge there, bringing reformation and transformation to Canada. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Good evening, Yolanda and um, uh, Pastor Paulette. Praise God, all these ministers. I'm glad that we can converge on this spot, you know, and um, uh, get into the Word of God. Um, so as you log on, just go into the comment box and say, hey, so that we know that you're out there. Because um, oftentimes I see the number is higher than the people that are um, <laughs> logging on and saying something you know people don't always say something but that's okay um all right let's pray i don't think i have any announcements and we're going to jump back into the revelation of jesus christ um this is going to be an in-depth study it's going to take us a minute to get through it because we're taking it verse by verse good evening donna and uh, my friend Farmer Ransom <laughs> in uh, Arizona. Margaret, my friend Yuli, praise God, just woke up. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace, for your great love, for your compassion, for your faithfulness. Thank you for this opportunity that you have provided us where we can gather together across these airwaves in different regions and parts of the country and um, even in other countries. Um, but we can come together through this Bible study, break open the bread of life and feast and feed upon the word of the living God. We know in our hearts that the word is more than a book. The word is a person, Jesus, our Christ. And it is in his name and for his sake that we gather and um, we have an explosive expectancy that you are going to um, be with us. Give us fresh revelation. We thank you ahead of time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, you're going to want to... Um, uh, you're going to want to get your Bible. I did put um, a few notes uh, just as a reference. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, most of the, most of the, the notes, you're just going to, we're going to be going through the text and <laughs> hopefully you got a Bible that's got margins you can write in or that. It's just not possible for me to write down all of the information um, that there is regarding this book. Um, for instance, I um, keep um, showing you this. This is a big, fat, heavy book by 
Rick Renner called A Light in Darkness, Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. This is this whole big fat book really is just dealing with the first few chapters in the, in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Tonight, if I stop rambling, we're going to get to chapter two and talk about the church at Ephesus. And just to give you an idea, I mean, this section all the way, oh man, all the way, all of that. See all those pages? All those pages is about the church at Ephesus. <laughs> No way I can. That's no way I can convey that to you. Um, but if you got a few extra bucks and you're a bibliophile like I am, uh, go online and order Rick Renner. You can order it from his ministry, or you can get it from Christian Books. I'm sure you can probably get it on Amazon as well. A Light and Darkness, and you'll have stuff to read for days. Okay. All right. Grab your notes. Grab your Bible, and let's jump in okay um we are at the end of the um first chapter and just to um refresh our memory i'm going to read all the way down from the beginning we started let me turn that off we started um revelations chapter one i did some uh an introduction and overview We've been taking it verse by verse. We ended at verse 15. So we're just going to read through and I'm going to try my best not to go up all the bunny trails. If you missed the first two sessions, they are on my Facebook, not Facebook, my YouTube channel. Um, just put my name in, Bernardine Wormley Daniels. You should be able to find the YouTube channel and there's tons of Bible study teachings there to keep you occupied, occupied for over a year, you know? Okay, so let's start in the beginning. We're gonna work our way to verse 15 and then on. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. I'm reading from um, the English Standard Version, okay? This is my little handy uh, journal-like version um, where you have the script on one side and blank page on the other. And so you can see how many notes I have just on that first section. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So, so an angel comes to John with a message from Jesus that Jesus got from the Father. Okay, to give. Okay. All right. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud. That's why we're we're doing that. Who reads aloud, meaning to know again accurately um, um, and hear, to keep, to guard um, the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear, those who those who understand. Those who understand and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. Okay. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now you remember his audience is Jewish. Primarily this book is riddled with prophetic um, illustrations and references. So John is presupposing that his audience knows what's in what they call the Tanakh, which is what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures from Genesis through Malachi. He presupposes that you know that, okay? Um, so that who is, who was, who is to come, that's the yud he vav he yud he vav he the name of God that Jews don't even pronounce, but we see it in our Bibles translated as Lord. So John is letting them know this message is coming from the Lord, the Lord, yud he vav he the Lord God Almighty, okay, who was, who is, who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. I don't even have time to go back into that, but that was rich. 
and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he do be the chief in charge. Okay. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. That's a good place to pause and shout by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests. He made us a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of priests. That means that you and I are called to minister unto the Lord and to one another. Um, priest to his God and father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Now, you know, with all the technology we have and, you know, satellite, you know, you, you know, new breaking news alerts on your phone. When he does decide to split the clouds and come, everybody going to see him. OK, um, it'll be, you know, breaking news flashed on the TV. Well, that'd be an interesting day. Those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will well on account of him. Even so, amen. Uh, verse 8, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and the Omega. That's so good. We can't, we can't go back into that. Says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So John is just really emphasizing that this letter is from the Lord, okay? I, John, now, and remember we talked about how he doesn't say, I, John, the most right, very reverend, holy, you know, left, pope, you know, apostle. He doesn't do that. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he had been exiled, remember, um, to Patmos, which was kind of like Alcatraz or something like that. It was a it was an island prison that nobody wanted to um, be exiled to. There was not much there. Many people died of starvation and exposure to the elements, you know, that type of thing, um, as well as the harsh treatment. Um, so he had been exiled on account of the word and the testimony of Jesus. And so then verse 10, remember, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And we broke that down. We, we dealt with the fact that that's not necessarily referring to a Sunday, but you remember, um, the Lord's day, you remember the emperor during this particular time had declared you know, emperors declared themselves, particularly this one, as Lord, that they were Lord, that you had to burn incense to them. You had to worship them. That's how John got exiled because he refused to do it. OK. And so this particular, you know, the emperor had a, a not only were you supposed to just worship him daily, but there was a particular day during the month called the Lord's Day, which was the emperor's day where everybody was supposed to stop everything they were doing and worship the emperor as God. And so it was on this particular day, that day referred to as the Lord's day, that John was caught up in the spirit and the Lord reveals himself as the real Lord and that every day is his day. So you can look at it that way. You can also look at it prophetically as the day of the Lord is a prophetic time when the when the king of glory will come again. When he comes, he comes with judgment. OK, so all of that is implied in the text. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So Jesus is the true Lord, not the emperor Domitian. OK, which we're going to take a look at that in a momentum. All right. Let's see, where was I? And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Seven being that very prophetic number. You'll see that number used over and over in this book. Seven being the number of wholeness and completion and fullness. The seven churches. So even though there are seven types of churches mentioned, which could refer to seven church ages, which we're going to look at in just a minute, but it is a, it is a prophetic um, um, allusion to the entirety of the church, okay? 
to um, the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Okay, so seven historical churches that some believe could represent seven church ages, seven prophetic periods. We're going to take a look at it and see, but there were regional churches in those seven um, areas that were actually, you know, the Romans were notorious for building highways and made, which made transportation easier for them to get back and forth. And that's how they had dominion over so many areas because of the roads that they built. So there was a particular road that would take you, if you started at the beginning, you would hit the church in Smyrna, keep going down the road, eventually you come, I mean, Ephesus, then you come to Smyrna, then you come to Pergamum. So they were all on a, on a, on a roll, on a path that you could take and hit all of those regions or like a highway, we would say today. Okay. Um, all right. Um, where are we? Verse 12. Okay, we're getting close. Then I turn to see. I turn to see, blepo. I turn to discern, to understand the voice that was speaking to me. Now, what's amazing about this is this is John, you know, the one who is the beloved disciple. He knew the Lord, right? But he is encountering him in a way that he has never encountered him before. He knew the historical Jesus, the man, Messiah, um, you know, his rabbi, you know, his friend. But this is the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and the, the one whose eyes blaze <laughs> like fire, you know. So listen, um, he sees him in a different way. So he turns to blepo, not just to see, but to discern and to understand in seeing the voice that was speaking. And in turning, isn't it interesting that the first thing he sees instead of the Lord, he sees the seven golden lampstands, which is representative of the church. All right, and in the midst of the lampstands, he sees the church the lampstands, and in the midst or the middle of the church, the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash. We broke all those pieces down. The long robe, of course, that goes down to, you know, his feet. These are priestly garments, and yet he's got that golden sash, not around his belt, but around his chest, representing extreme authority because it's up high and it's not, it's not, um, lined with gold. It is made of pure gold. So it represents, you know, indescribable wealth and prominence and, and authority. Um, the hairs of his head are white like wool. Um, uh, he, he, this is a picture of like the ancient of days. Okay. His eyes were like a flame of fire representing perfect wisdom and discernment, his feet like burnished bronze. And oh, we broke that down before that mixture of bronze and frankincense and just the, the, um, because of the, the words that, um, uh, John used in the Greek, which is a, a hint as to not only the, um, the authority and the judgment, but the, um, the mercy which on which he stands. Okay. Um, his voice was like the roar of many waters. If you've ever been multitudes of, of people, waters usually representing. In his right hand, um, he held uh, seven stars. Again, that's completion. And the stars, we're going to find out in a minute that those stars represent um, um, the, the angels or the messengers or the, the pastors, the leaders of, of those churches. And from his mouth came a shot. Oh, wait, I raced past. We were at verse 15. Okay, let me slow down. <laughs> I was getting ready to race past all of that. Okay, let's slow down. Let's slow down now. Okay, so um, verse 15. His feet were like fine brass as if they burned in a, in a, in a furnace. The original word for brass um, is a Greek word, which I'm not going to try to pronounce, but it's a compound of um, uh, like chalkos and libanos, which means an alloy of carp copper or bronze or zinc or brass, and the word libanos, which is the Greek word for frankincense. 
And so, of course, when you study it, you find out what's interesting about this word is that there was no such alloy known on earth that was comprised of bronze and frankincense. <laughs> so it was a strange word for John to use. So, but if, if we remember that Christ first appears as high priest and that the priest used frankincense in their, in their priestly ministry, then the meaning becomes clear. And I should say, you miss that in the English, when you read it in the English. It's not until you dig into the original language and begin to break open the treasure that is hidden in the original language that you find these things, that this is a reference to um, Christ high priestly ministry. So he's coming with the potential to judge because of the way he's dressed. You can tell that he comes with that type of authority. His feet of judgment, though, that burnished bronze representing that judgment, but they had been bathed in frankincense. So in other words, Jesus did not want to judge his church but even his judgment was bathed in prayer and in the priestly ministry of intercession. I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that. See, I'm glad about that. So he's not coming to destroy his church. He is coming to correct. Yes, my friend Amy over in um, uh, Canada, Amy could do a whole workshop. We could pause right here, have her come in and talk forever just about frankincense and the medicinal, um, the properties and, and, and what frankincense is used for. And that's what his feet are bathed in. <laughs> that's real prophetic. You'll have to look at that, uh, Amy, and give me some insight um, into that. So in other words, he's coming not to destroy, not a judgment that destroys, but a judgment that corrects. And I, let me go back. See, now I'm in my mind on a bunny trail because I know that frankincense, you can use frankincense for just a, all kinds of things when it comes to healing and um, uh, restoration. Um, and that's amazing that that's what his feet are bathed in. Okay, let's keep going. Maybe we'll come. Uh, we're going to do that one day because I've been saying that Amy and I were going to um, come on live and do, um, yeah, when in doubt, use Frank. I have lots of frankincense around here. I put it on everything. When I'm in doubt, like I went to the doctor and they took blood. I went to have a physical and they took blood and I don't know, I have those small veins that move. So they always bruise me. And there was a huge bruise there. I just, I was like, God, what do I put on this? Well, I got frankincense. I just rubbed frankincense all over it. Okay, anyway, it's gone now. There's no bruise there now. Okay, back to the Bible. That's very prophetic, by the way. Okay, so um, um, where was I? So he's coming. Um, there's no rush to judgment with Christ. He always comes with mercy first. Okay. So then we look at verse 16 in his right hand, he held seven stars and from his mouth came a sharp, that's significant, two edged sword. And his face was like the shining sun in full strength. And so he has in his right hand, seven stars. Um, so now here's, here's what is historically interesting about this. Now you have to remember, we established in the first session that we have to read this with a Hebraic first century, second temple historical mindset. Okay. So that that's very significant, that expression, seven stars. Here's why the emperor Domitian had an, in such an exalted, um, opinion of himself that he claimed that he was God. And he declared that his son, who had died as a baby, he declared that his son was Jupiter. You know, kind of makes you wonder about Domitian, okay? But that's what he said. So he said that Jupiter was supposed to be the father of the gods. So in 
the historical Ephesus, the, the region, there was a giant temple that was built to Domitian and the center of Domitian worship for all of Asia. So he had built this huge temple where people came, um, the emperor, to worship him as God and his, his son Jupiter as like the, the, the father of gods. They, they were just crazy. Every time like somebody would go to the store or to the market, you know, of that particular era to shop, including the Apostle John, when they pull money out of their pocket or out of their bag to purchase something, one of the coins would have had a picture of Domitian's son who had died along with seven stars, okay, on the coins. And so it's as if Jesus, so you couldn't even purchase without using something that reminded you of the so-called divinity and rulership of Domitian and his deceased son. Okay. So, um, um, so when Jesus, um, gives John this picture of himself and in his right hand, he's holding seven stars. It's as if he's telling John, Hey, listen, not only all that stuff that John had already seen, I'm the Aleph and the Tav, you know, he's, he's got hair white, like wool, his eyes blazing with fire. He's all of that. He says, and let me show you something else. John, he extends his hand and he's holding seven stars. So it's like saying, if you want to really know who rules the universe, Universe, it's not Domitian and it's not his son. It do be me. I am the one who has these seven stars in my right hand. So it has a historical significance as well as a prophetic symbolic significance, which we'll see in just a minute. So it was a specific message. So we read it and we might not get it all these years later, but John would have understood. Now you have to remember, these are people who are living in dire circumstances. They are living under extreme persecution. Every day is a day that you could be arrested or stoned or burned alive or crucified or fed to the lions or sent into the gladiator ring for them to use you as target practice or, you know, that was a day, daily possibility, okay? And so these are people who needed reminders that in spite of what it looked like, Jesus was still on the throne, okay? Amen. That was a good place to say amen. And so it shows how personal Jesus' communication um, is to them and to us even still. He knows where you are. He knows exactly what to say to you that will be an encouragement to you. Um, Revelations 1 and verse 16, that's where we are. Um, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Out of his mouth, so he has the seven stars, then he has, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Um, what's interesting is that that word for sharp is the Greek word oxus, which means it could be translated as vinegar. And vinegar during that particular time was a type of antiseptic. That's so good. So look at it. He, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Now we know that the Bible describes a two-edged sword as the word of God. Matter of fact, it's in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus where he's describing the full armor of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the spoken word of God. And so out of his mouth is coming a word sharp, um, cutting, cutting, can cut you coming and going, okay? Because it's, it's a double-edged sword. So look at that. But it, it's, it's, um, its sharpness is the vinegar, which is an antiseptic. And so in other words, Jesus... Um, the antiseptic is used to numb the pain, to, to um, help you to be able to endure what's coming. Okay, are you with me? And so 
um, it's like a medication so that the procedure that you need to save your life can occur. Oh, like, thank you, Lord. Like I went to the dentist, um, lately I was eating something, a piece of caramel or something, it's that thick, thick, thick caramel, just bit down on it and just completely broke a tooth and had to go to a dentist. And so I had to either, you can either get a root canal or we can give you an implant. I, I, I said, I'll do the implant. So they give you first, they take something on his finger. He just rubs it in there and it numbs the, the, the area. So then he can give you the shots all in the tooth and all around the tooth. And you don't care because it's numb. That's the unaccepted. That's the oxus. So that what's coming, you know, if you didn't have the antiseptic, it would hurt. But because he is a merciful priest and king. He gives you the antiseptic so that when he applies the word, that double-edged sword of the word, it doesn't hurt. It just performs the surgery on our hearts and it gets the job done. Okay. Are you guys with me? That was worth you tuning in tonight. And so he doesn't come whacking away at us when he comes into our lives, even with correction, he helps to numb the pain as he speaks to us, even if it is for correction. So when somebody is speaking to you and they are cutting you up, as people say in the world, and it has no grace or mercy clothed around it, it's not the spirit of Christ. Just saying. It's their flesh. Okay. So um, the Holy Spirit <coughs> prepares our hearts so that the Spirit of God can insert his blade into our souls and surgically extract the things from our lives that do not need to be there. Praise God. <clears throat> so that's the second part of that verse. He has a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in its full strength. So his countenance is brilliant. Um, is used to describe Jesus, you know, when he is in the transfiguration or the resurrected Christ. Um, when I was a child and I had that encounter with the Lord where he comes into my room, he appears normal in that scene, you know, but I know it's him when he reaches for me, when I reach for him, then suddenly when I take his hand, we're translated and he is trans. Um, figured. His garments are an indescribable white, unlike any white that you could see on earth, like light, white, like the sun, white. And his face, from his face, there was just like this. His face shone like the sun shining in his full strength. That is, that, that's the kind of encounter that is indelibly um, tattooed on your soul and you don't forget when you have encountered Christ in that way. Praise God. And so um, John was squinting at the exalted Christ. He's more than squinting. He, he is undone. So look at verse 17. When I saw him, because see now he's seeing the resurrected ruling. Um, this is the, the Christ before you know, the, 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 the eternal one, the pre-eternal one, see? So he sees him for who he really is. When I saw him, verse 17, I fell at his feet as though dead. Um, I fell at his feet as though dead. Um, oh, where did I write the, oh, that word um, uh, for fell it, it means that he collapsed, like all the strength, all, all the, all the strength, you know, oh man, Lord, come like that, you know, move like that in our churches, you know, um, touch people in our services like that, you know, so that even the most arrogant, you know, and prideful will find themselves undone, no strength left in them. And they collapse without anybody touching them so no man can take the glory. Oh, look how the anointing flows through me. No, Lord, just fall on people. 
<laughs> you know, so that they know they have encountered the living Christ. So John collapsed. He fell. That word in the Greek means he collapsed. All strength left him as though dead, like a corpse. It's like John fainted. Have you ever, you know, have you ever been um, scrolling on Facebook or on TikTok or whatever it is, and you see those videos of the people strapped into the, the seat comes over you, like from the top, they're in that slingshot ride. Who would, who would get on that ride? Bernardine would not get on. Bernardine would hold the bags of the people who go to get on that ride. I'm not, you couldn't pay me enough to get on that ride. So people get on the ride. And of course they have a camera on the ride somewhere. And people are usually joking or really, you know, like they are not scared. And they let that thing go. And I have seen video after video after video of people fainting. They faint for a few seconds, and then when they wake up and realize they still hold that thing, they scream and holler, and they, <laughs> they faint again. Okay, seriously, that was John. <laughs> John was undone, okay? Oh, man. Lord, you know, come in our services like that. All right, verse 17. He fell at his feet. At his feet, you know, like that's the place of submission and humility. It's also the place of discipleship. Disciples sat at the feet of their rabbi. Um, um, he doesn't sit. He just falls down like a dead man. <laughs> but Jesus, what does he do? He lays his right hand, his right hand, on him saying <clears throat> fear not now this is significant too wait one second let me find those notes um he lays his right hand fear not um and what's interesting is that when you look at this in the original language um he laid his right hand on me saying it's in a continuous a continuous tense. So it's not that he said it, it's like he's he's saying it and it echoes like through eternity. So he is continually saying to us, fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to come closer. Don't be afraid to come deeper into, um, don't be afraid to come into the throne room. Don't be afraid to lay your life down from fear not. Don't be afraid of whatever your circumstances are. I got you. My, even if I come with burnished bronze feet, they are bathed in frankincense. Fear not. It's a continuous fear not. It applies even for, uh, um, today. Praise God. So he says, fear not. And he continues to say it and continues to say it. It echoes through eternity and it applies even to us today. And look at the next, the, the next expression. Um, fear not. He says, this is verse 17. I am the first and the last. There's I'm the Aleph and the Tav is what he would have said in Hebrew. <clears throat> that has tremendous ex uh, significance for um, the Hebraic mind, because that goes all the way back to Genesis in the Bereshit bara Elohim et, which is the Aleph Tav, Bereshit bara Elohim et, um, Hashemayim va'et ha'aretz. So in the beginning, God created Aleph Tav, the heavens, and Vav Aleph Tav, and the earth. So Aleph Tav is the signature, is his initials, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Aleph and the Tav. Very, very, very prophetic. It means I do be the one who did, who did it all, okay? <laughs> so that one, that one laid his hand on John, just like he will lay his hand on you, telling you fear not, and that fear not echoes, regardless of what's going on, your circumstances in life, regardless of what the enemy is doing or trying to plague you with fear not, regardless of what you're going through, fear not, okay? And then he lays his hand on John, as he, even as he does on us. I'm the first in the lab. I am the living one, 
the living one. I do be. He's the only one that can make that that proclamation. I am He that liveth and was dead. In other words, I am the living one. The ESV translates it very good out of the Greek, meaning the living one. I am perpetually alive. I'm perpetually alive. Death was a nanosecond in my um, journey or my existence because he's an eternal being. He's the the beginning and the end, you know. So um, I am the he that perpetually lives. Okay. Um, so the crucifixion was powerful. The death burial was like a nanosecond that accomplished it, it much. Okay. Um, but he's alive forevermore. All right. So he's just reminding us. And behold, I, oh, matter of fact, he says it in the verse. I'm the living one. I died. And behold, um, that word behold um, is a word that is difficult. It's, it's almost untranslatable in the, in the Hebrew and in the English. Um, it's a word that carries a lot of emotion. It's like saying, wow, like, like, wow, like, you know, um, just tremendous excitement, you know, and behold, you know, listen. So in other words, I'm the eternally alive when I died and wow, you know, I am alive forevermore, <laughs> you know, take that devil. Essentially, there's, there's excitement in the term. Behold, look, look, see, I'm alive forevermore. Okay. <laughs> it's just good. And, and he says it several times in the New Testament. Everywhere you see that, behold, there is excitement behind whatever is getting ready to follow it. Okay. He says, behold, not only am I alive, but look, I have the keys of death and Hades. I have the keys. I have the authority. I have... Um, uh, the, the access I can open and no man can shut. I can shut and no man can open. I have the keys. <laughs> That's so good. He has the keys to death and Hades. And so look at verse 19, right? Therefore, the things that you have seen that word see, meaning that you have perceived and understood, right? What you, what I've showed you, what I've given you insight into. Okay. And um, those that are and those that are to take place. So write the things that you have seen, the things that are. So as we read, this book is going to refer to things that are. And it's also going to refer to some things that are going to take place. So it is a historical and yet prophetic book all at the same time. Okay. Verse 20. Um... As for the mystery of the seven stars, and here he, he breaks it down in case anybody was confused. The mystery of the seven stars, the seven stars that you see in my right hand. The seven stars, now get this in this historical context. The seven stars is not the Domitian's dead son, you know, and he, he Jupiter and the, 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 the father of the gods. No, the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers or the sent ones, my leaders of the seven churches, those reverent, reverent um, uh, regions, even ages, the leadership down through the, the, the years, um, those, are the, those are the star, my seven stars. They are the angels, the messengers, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So when you see a reference in the book of Revelation to lampstand is talking about the church and the stars is talking about the angels or the messengers, the leaders, the sent ones, those that God sends with a message. They do be the real stars. The stars, I should say, that are held in his hand. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to know that we are held 
in, but let me speak to the leadership in the church that's listening to me. You are held, everybody is held in his hand, but he is particularly holding for, you know, the purposes that are his own because he's, he's tasked us with, you know, building and nurturing and, and equipping and, you know, developing and, 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 you know, spreading his church. See, he's holding us in his right hand, which represents that place of covenant uh, relationship and authority. All right, peeps. What time is it? All right, we're going to get to chapter two. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Let's put those notes away. Uh, and we are going to go to chapter two. All righty. Drum roll. Okay, so before we get into this, just let me take 10 minutes right here and uh, look at the notes that I, um, I posted on my page. It says uh, the seven church ages. So there are, you remember in the introduction, I talked about different ways that some people interpret the book of Revelation. And um, uh, some of them look at these churches, these letters to these churches that we're going to look at. There are some historians who see these as seven specific church ages, okay? Um, I would say yes and not quite, you know, okay? So yes, the, it could be a reference to ages, but it is not limited to that. It couldn't, or the Laodicean age is in trouble because that's the last letter to the last church, okay? So it has to be that these um, letters or ages have a local application, meaning that it referred to the people right then, right there, the church at Ephesus and Smyrna and Colossae, and, and, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea, all those places in its historical, local time in human history, it referred to them um, for real. Also, as we read these letters, you need to know that it could also have, and I believe it does, have a prophetic application so that what was written to them is also a mirror into which we can look and it applies to our age as well as to us as an individual. So these letters are going to have prophetic application down through time as well as references to seven periods prophetic periods. It could be that. It could also be individual application. So that's what makes it a living word. Okay. All right. Um, just so you know that. So real quick, uh, we're going to take like eight more minutes and look at that. And then we're going to get into um, the church in Ephesus. So I, I put this on my Facebook page. So just take a look at, this is what some scholars believe. And I'm giving you this information you can do with it what you will, but if you bump into people or you're talking to people about the book of Revelation and they start going up this trail, at least you'll understand what they are saying and why they believe what they believe. But you can have the wisdom to know, well, okay, that may have dealt with a particular age, but it's not limited to that age. It also has application prophetically, for churches down through human history and for um, personal application to me today, okay? Just so you know, I want you to have a broader understanding than some people may try to squeeze you through a very narrow interpretation of these things. So just look at it real quick, just so you'll know. Um, the first age um, would have been, and, and let me say, uh, we're going to look at um, these ages and these periods. Um, they kind of intersect um, because these ages were ruled by particular Roman emperors or 10 periods of persecution, which is a reference to 10 days, which is mentioned when we get deeper into Revelation as um, um, uh, 10 days or a, a time of persecution. 
Um, and so there are some that believe that those are 10 periods of persecution or tribulation, and they pick 10 key emperors who were notorious for being horrible um, um, leaders who did a ma massive damage to the church. Um, and so they, they, they intersect these ages, okay? So the Ephesus age, real quick, so we could get to the text, would have been around the year, and these are approximate dates, okay, approximate dates. The Ephesus age um, around uh, AD 33 to AD 200. So if you look over at the emperor's column, you'll see that in that time period, you were dealing with Nero, who was crazy as all get out, um, burning people, make, making them, turning them into candle. This stuff will help these letters to make more sense to you because this is what the church was dealing with um, during this time period. 64 to 68 AD, you had Nero burn Rome down, blamed it on the Christians. Everybody knew Nero did it, but he blamed it on the Christians. He were crucifying them, um, throwing Christians in the pits with lions and wild animals for sport. He's the one who executed Paul and possibly even Peter. Um, he was the one who would have Christians dipped in wax tied to stakes and burned alive as human candles to light his gardens. He was that crazy, okay? Ephes um, Nero, 64 to 68 AD. So the Ephesus age, Nero was alive and well, okay? Um, Domitian from, um, it, they're on my Facebook page. Um, but I can, I will repost them. I'm pretty sure they're there because I looked to check before I, I came on. Um, but yeah, um, the, yeah, the notes are there. It, it, the, the, note, the notes may say the revelation of Christ, but when you open the link, it's about the seven church ages, okay? But I'll repost it just in case. Um, Domitian, um, 81 to 96 AD, he was crazy as all get out, killed thousands of Christians in Rome. He's the one who banished John to the Isle of Patmos, okay? So this, this book was during this time of Domitian, okay? All of this is in the first Ephesus age. So when we read the, the letter to the Ephesians, we're going to put it in that, the context of a particular um, age or prophetic period, okay? Um, you had Trajan, 98 to 117 AD. He just outlawed, uh, outlawed um, Christianity. He's the one who burned St. Ignatius at the stake. St. Ignatius, I have many writings and books. Um, he's the one who um, uh, is um, known for the examine, um, powerful, powerful saint and priest of God, St. Ignatius, he was burned at the stake by Trajan um, um, in the 100s um, AD. So again, this is during the, ap the Ephesus age or the apostolic church. What's interesting about this age, as we go into the, this letter to the church at, at Ephesus, um, the church was spreading like wildfire in spite of the persecution. What is wrong with us today? I'm just asking. We have forgotten something. Then you have Marcus Aurelius. They were all crazy. He was the one who tortured and beheaded Christians for sport. You had the fifth um, period of persecution. Severus burned and crucified and beheaded Christians. You had Maximinius executed Christians. You had Decius he was super crazy. Um, he, tr he tried to wipe Christianity off the map and he executed those, anybody he could find that confessed Christ, they were a done deal. This is what people were dealing with. You know, um, that was 249 to 251 AD during his reign. Valerian tried to wipe out Christianity. He's the one who executed the Bishop of Carthage. Aurelian persecuted any Christians that he could find as well. Diocletian was the worst of them all, 
284 to 305 um, AD. He was the one who came right before the emperor who um, outlawed persecution and made Christianity um, legal. But Diocletian was the worst of all. He martyred and burned not only believers, but the scriptures as well. So those um, 10 days or 10 periods of persecution ran from the, you know, definitely begin to escalate with Nero in around 64 um, AD all the way into the 300s. Okay, so let's go back now and look at the church of Ephesus. If you look at it in terms of historical ages, that would be the church from 333 to 200 AD, although it is very applicable to us today. I received a prophetic word years ago from Bishop Bill Hammond, the father of the prophetic and apostolic movement in this country um, at Shekinah years ago. And when he was giving me the word, the one it was the one part that is tattooed on my brain is when he picked up his Bible and sat down as if exhausted and began to say, I hear the Lord saying to you the same thing that he said to me. He said, you are like me. You have to work at resting. You work and you work and you work. But the Lord says, so let's see what the Lord said to the church at Ephesus. During that word, one of the things the Lord said to me is, you work and I'm, and I'm proud of this and I love that you do that. But here's what I have against you. You have left your first love. Oh, and I remember, and he said, the Lord says you need to come apart with me before you come apart. That was several years ago. I kept working, of course, until I got to the point in 2019 where I was literally coming apart. And that's how I got involved with TC, the Transforming Community, because it is a um, immersive um, teaching retreat um, experience for pastors and leaders in um, spiritual transformation for us to find some nurturing and rest for our souls. So the church at Ephesus, definitely applicable today because it was apl applicable to me. So let's look at it. Here we go. Perfect timing. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, um, the angel, the messenger, the leaders, the peepus, the peepus, of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars. Is, isn't that interesting that the church starts with, um, I mean, or this, this word, to, this letter to this church starts with a picture of Jesus holding, holding his leadership in his hand. You know, you know, if I could just talk to those of you who serve in whatever capacity in ministry, whether you are, um, you serve as a volunteer or you serve as a part of the fivefold ministry, many times when you are serving in church, not just somebody who comes to church and sits and listen and then go home, I'm talking about the people that get involved, particularly the leadership, you need to know that he's got you in his hands. OK, he is holding you in his not just his hand, but his right hand. He's holding you in the place of honor and authority. See, you know, that's how he sees you. OK, look at this. And I should say too, those of you, however you serve the Lord, whether in um, uh, what we call a sacred setting or a secular setting, however you serve in him, he's got you in his right hand. Look at this. Who walks among, not only is he holding the leadership of his church in his hand, in his right hand, in the place of honor and authority, which means that's how we should hold his leadership as well. Whether we like them or agree with them or not, we're supposed to honor them because he honors them. You don't have to like them. You just have to honor. 
Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, all right. So who holds the seven stars, the messengers, the angels, his church leadership in his right hand. And not only that, but he's walking, lest any of you go, well, this just talking about the leadership. What does it have to do with me? <laughs> no, come on, y'all. We got to do better. Finish the sentence. It says, He's holding, yes, the leadership in his hand, but he's walking amongst the seven golden lampstands. I mean, he's in the midst of the church. He's walking around in the church. He's walking through our regions and our territories, the, 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 the communities where our churches are planted. He's walking through our churches. What would happen on Sunday mornings if we were acutely aware of where he was in our midst and what he was doing and if we yielded to that i'm just saying okay to the angel of the church in ephesus right the words of him who holds he's got us in his right hand the place of honor and authority he's walking among the seven golden lampstands he is walking in the church and let me let me go back the words of him who holds that word holds is the Greek word krateo, and it means to lay hold of. It means to rule. So he should be ruling the leadership. The leadership doesn't rule over the church, but Christ rules in our life. And if he is ruling in our life, then our leadership will not be burdensome to the people that are in the church that he's walking amongst. Okay, are you guys with me? Okay, um, so it means to take possession of. He has taken possession of his church and its structure, and we need to be make sure that we're aligning with what he's saying. Verse 2, I know your works. <laughs> I know. That's the word oida, and it means to have seen, to understand. So he's got us. He's holding us. He has taken hold. He, he's ruling. He has possession. He's walking amongst his church. And if he's walking amongst our, us, <clears throat> then you need to know. He says, listen, I, I've seen what's happening in your church. I, I, I know your works. I have seen and I understand What's that? That's what that word means. Oida. I've seen and I understand your works, your labor, what you have done, all the meetings you showed up to, all the pr times of intercession, every time you volunteered, all, all the, every, every way that you tried to serve and leave. I've seen it. I've, I was there. I, I haven't abandoned you. And, and, and again, let's put this in context. This is a church that is persecuted. These, these people are, are under persecution. So he's saying, regardless of what's going on, I'm holding you. I see you. I understand. I know your works, your works and your toil. And see that word in the Greek is the word kopos. It means intense labor. Not, and it's not just talking about, um, like if, you know, spring, oh, well, let's put it in context now because we got a winter storm coming. Some of us may get 12 or more inches of snow. So I live on a corner unit. So that means I have to shovel from the street to my porch across the front of my house all the way up the side of my house, past the backyard to the garage my driveway, if I want to get out, that's a that is labor. But this isn't just labor that's exhausting. This is intense labor with trouble. That word means you're working, and while you're working, like maybe the the snowblower runs out of gas, and you got to go to the gas station, and you can't get to the gas station because you snowed in. So you got to trudge by, you know that kind of toil and trouble, you know, in this context, these people were dealing with those crazy emperors that we were, that I was just, namely Domitian, because Domitian was the emperor, I think, no, 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 
That's wrong. Not Domitian. Um, yeah, Domitian. He's the one who banished John to the Isle of Patmos. And he was baddie as all get out. So he's the one that they, they would have been dealing with. Okay. So I know your works and your toil, your, your, your intense labor with trouble. God sees you in that situation. He knows that it hasn't been easy. He knows that you didn't just have a hard time, but you had a hard time with trouble. That you've been feeling like somebody opened one of the uh, lower regions of hell, a gate, and let a, you know, a whole legion of demons out with a, a map with your address and your house circled with a line through it. And they've been following you to work and all that kind of stuff. He knows. He sees it. Your toil. And look at this. You're in the midst of the toil, in, in the midst of the work, in the midst of the difficulty, you have patiently endured. Man, you, you have patiently endured. That is the word hupomone. Sometimes you'll see it as hupomeno, same root structure. That is one of my most favorite words in all the New Testament. Hupomeno, because the Lord gave me that word in a dream. He just It just looped. I heard it over and over and over. It repeated. When I woke up, I was like, what in the world does that mean? Had to look it up. Sure enough, New Testament Greek. And it may, it may, it's translated as endurance, steadfast. It's the type of endurance that is steadfast in its faith. It is the characteristic of a person who is not swerved from their deliberate purpose and their loyalty to faith and piety, even in the midst of trials and sufferings, regardless of what they're going through, even if they are um, in the midst of a group of people that they are about to push into the Colosseum, in the, in the middle of a ring of hungry lions, they hupo meno. They begin to praise God, even in the midst of it. What is wrong with us? We need to get our act. We need to get, okay. Maybe it was for me. I need to get my act together. We need to get our act together. Okay, I'm just saying. Hupo meno, patiently and steadfastly endure. Chief, cheerful, hopeful endures. Hupomeno. It is a fortitude that no situation can defeat. The enemy throw everything he got at you and you will still worship God in the midst of it. That's Hupomeno. That is what Jesus is saying to this church. They, they were enduring. They were dealing with all that Domitian and not just Domitian, but even the Jewish um, nation that was pouring out against them because they had become a part of that sect that followed Yeshua as Messiah. They were being persecuted coming and going. Okay. All right. So you get it. I have a whole class that I do just on that one word. Hupo <clears throat> Mone. That's what this is. I know your works. I know that you have gone through intense labor with lots of trouble. And in the midst of it, you have patiently endured. And I have seen, I know, I've seen, I understand how you cannot bear in the, in, with those who are evil. You, you, you cannot bear. That means, um, that, that word bear, it means um, that you have no tolerance, that you, you just don't have any tolerance for evil. That word evil is the Greek word kakos. It means not just people who do bad stuff, but it's people who do bad stuff and they draw other people into their game. They do evil stuff and they get other people in tr into the trouble with them. That's, that's what this is saying. I, I've seen your works. I see how you labor. I see how you have endured in the midst of, 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 of intense labor with trouble, toil. You have patiently endured. You have dug in and held on. You have praised me <clears throat> anyhow. And you have, you have not tolerated 
um, people that's playing games and pulling other folk into it. You you ain't got no time no no time for the foolishness. I see it. I, I see it. See, don't you love the Lord? I I just love it. Look at this. But have tested those who call. That's that, that's a Greek word that means say. They say they're apostles and they're not. And you have found them to be false. That is the Greek word sudes, where we get pseudo, sudes. It means to lie. It is deceitful. It is untrue. So in this particular instance, he is talking about there are people who they, they, they're not patiently enduring. They, um, they're not intolerant when it comes to evil. They want to call good evil and evil good. And then they want to draw you into their mess. And you have tested that word tested. It means that you have examined it. In other words, not a criticism, but you have, you have taken the word and held it up beside them to see whether or not what they're saying and doing lines up with this. You have tested them against the word of God. See, not uh, judging, condemning them to hell. That's something different. So people will say, well, the Bible say you ain't supposed to judge. No, they're pulling that out of the Sermon on the Mount. I believe it's in Matthew 5 through 7, somewhere, I think more so Matthew chapter 7. And they'll say, you ain't supposed to judge. That is a completely, that means that you don't condemn somebody to hell because you don't sit on the throne. You don't have the final say. OK, you need to be praying that they don't go to hell because we don't want nobody wants to go to hell. But but when it comes to a, another type of judgment, which has to do with discernment, you need to be able to discern, to judge, to test, to examine to that type of judgment to see whether or not something is real or not. OK, and so these people at the church at Ephesus, um, he says, I know your works and your toil, your patient endurance. You have held on, dug in. You have not tolerated the, the foolishness, evil people that's starting trouble and trying to get you involved in it. You you have not dealt with them, um, but you have tested those who call, who say that they are apostles and they are not now. We could do an entire class on what that little vert, that one says, who call themselves apostles. What are apostles? Are they their apostles today? Yes, there are apostles today. If there were no, um, this, this letter to Ephesus wouldn't be applicable if there were not apostles that were true apostles outside the original 12. As a matter of fact, you can see that in the New Testament. There are other apostles that are named outside of the original 12, minus Judas, and then adding in Matthias, who was voted in by Lot. So he became a part of the 12. But then you have other apostles like um, Barnabas, um, um, Andronicus, and Junia. Um, there are other apostles that are mentioned um, in scripture, okay, as well as there are apostles today. In Ephesians um, 4 um, are listed what are referred to as the Doma gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are the five Doma ministry gifts that Christ gave. We, we describe them as the hand of God that he placed in, he put in his church as a governmental structure to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, okay? And so the apostolic gift, one of the things that's interesting is I was looking at um, uh, Rick Renner's book. He has a whole thick section just on the, the, the ministry of apostle. And he has a phenomenal class. I ain't going to be able to find it fast enough. I have it on, um, it's a study manual and like a video teaching on just that, the ministry of apostles. It is really good by Rick Renner. And um, apostles, apostolos in the Greek, it means um, those a sent one, those who are sent. 
you know, um, two have been sent with a mission. You're not just sent, you are sent as a messenger, as a messenger. Remember the messengers are the, the stars, the angels, the messengers that he has sent very apostolic. That's a very apostolic reference. The stars in the church, not like we think of stars. Oh, they're a star movie star. I, not that kind of thing. These are stars in the sense that they have been messengers sent with orders from the King of glory. He holds them in his hand as he sends them as messengers. So apostles, um, it was a, I'll tell you real quick, it was a um, military term, actually a maritime, like in the Navy, you had naval vessels, the lead vessel um, carried the admiral who was referred to as the, that ship was referred to as apostolic because it carried the apostle or the admiral who was commanding this fleet. So apostles were sent into regions as like God's generals, general contractors to lay foundation, very visionary to, to build the church, to raise up the saints, all those types of things. So, and, and there's more, but basically. So in this particular narrative, he's saying that there were um, um, those who were running around just like today. You have people that are, they run around, they say they're apostles, but when you, when you line them up uh, with the word of God, um, they don't meet the criteria. I had somebody say to me one time, well, you couldn't possibly be an apostle. Number one, they don't think there were any women apostles, but I beg to differ. There are women um, that are named as leaders and as an apostle in um, the New Testament. And, and you show it to them and they still just don't want to see it. They close their mind. Um, but they said, in order to be an apostle, you have to have seen Christ. They go to the book of Acts when they were choosing the one to replace Judas. And they said he had to be somebody who had walked among them. So he had to be a disciple who had seen the resurrected Christ. You haven't seen It's like, oh, well, I've seen him. He came and he, he walked into my room. I had a whole encounter with him. See, and then people shut up. They don't know what to do with that. So if that's a criteria, yeah, I can check that one off. Okay. All right. Um, let's keep going. So the, you found that they were false. They were pseudo. All right. I know you're patient enduring you're enduring patiently that's that hupomeno again and bearing up um for uh, my name's sake um he said and you have not grown weary in other words they have they have carried the burden they, they have been endured in persecution they have endured with crazy leaders in the church <clears throat> you know um pseudo apostolos um, they have dealt with, you know, saints that don't have any perseverance, you know, um, difficulty comes and they jump ship and they run in the opposite direction. He says, I know that you are enduring patiently and you are bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. See, you're not that word for weary means you have the, the, the toil, the difficulty, the labor with trouble that even produces grief, you have, you have carried it. And you, even though you are exhausted, that word exhausted, it, it says that you have not given up. You have carried the burden, even when it, <coughs> even when you were exhausted, you didn't quit for my name's sake. You have not grown weary. You didn't let the exhaustion take you out. You took the next step. You took the next step and the next step. Praise God. See, um, yeah, planting churches, yeah, is also um, a criteria, according to uh, Rick Renner, um, uh, that if you have not built anything, then you're not really a true apostle. True apostles plant church equip the saints, um, you know, have um, ex great revelation and wisdom. So when you're in a church that's led by an apostle, 
you are usually getting deeper revelation than you would at a local church. If the if the church is led by a pastor, somebody that has a shepherding anointing, just the revelation that you get in the preaching and teaching is going to be different than if you're in a in a church um, led by apostles. So that's why if you're going to network. You should have like you could have a network of churches that where you have elders or people with a real shepherding mantle, but they should be connected to apostles so that we make sure that the people are not um, um, just always getting baby food, but that they're getting some meat and that they're growing um, in uh, the things of God. OK. All right. So let's keep going so we can finish this one. Look. He says, but you, you, you have, you have hung in there. Like uh, Paul said in Galatians, um, do not be weary in well-doing for you shall reap if you faint not. These people at Ephesus didn't give up. Okay. So that was then in spite of the crazy emperors, these people dug in and held on even unto death. Yes. They didn't abandon the faith. They didn't grow weary. And then you get all of a sudden the brakes hit. <laughs> Here comes the sword um, with the um, anesthesia, the antiseptic, and the um, and here comes the the burnished bronze feet um, clothed in frankincense. <laughs> here it comes right here, verse four. But I have this against you: you have abandoned the love that you had abandoned. You know what's interesting? Where does the time go? Oh, we started late. We started at about four or five minutes after. So I'm going to go to about 835. Okay, you're going to have to give me five extra minutes. Look at this. But you have abandoned that word that is translated as, as abandoned is the Greek word me. Now that jumped out at me. That might not jump out at you. But that jumped out at me and I'll tell you why. Because me is the word that is translated as to forgive. But what forgiveness is, is exhaling. It means to exhale, to send forth, to send away. When you forgive, you send the person's offense or whatever you've been holding, that weight, you release it and let it go. You send it away. Well, Jesus is using this word in the context of love saying that this is what I have against you. You have sent away, you have forsaken somewhere. You let go your, the love you had at first. Are you guys out there? <laughs> he says, look church at Ephesus. Yes, you guys rock. You got it going on. You know how to persevere. You know how to deal with stupid. You know, with grace, you guys, you know, are keeping the faith. Here's what I have against you. You have afia me. You have sent away. You have forsaken. You somewhere, you yielded up. You let go of the love we had at first. Remember? Remember when you first fell in love with me? Remember Bernardine, how you would get up early in the morning before the crack of dawn and you would pray and, and read your Bible. You would fast, how your heart was hungry. Remember how you used to carry your Bible with you everywhere you went. The people in the neighborhood started to call your brother and say, man, what happened to your sister? Why is she always walking around with that big Bible? Remember, do you remember your, your first, uh, remember Bernie, how we used to be together all the time? Come on. He said, you, you, you sent it forth. You, you, you sent it away. <clears throat> You're doing all this other stuff, but where is the love? Where is the love? Where is the love? Where? Okay. I'm sorry. I had a moment. Okay. I'm back. Okay. But you have abandoned the love you had at first. <clears throat> so he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, look at this. That word in the Greek, and this stuff is not on paper. This stuff, beloved, is in my head and in my personal Bible. Sorry, I just couldn't write all this stuff down. Okay, so you have to listen. The, the, you have, from where you have fallen, look at this. 
That means, that's a word that means to descend from a higher place to a lower place. That means, in, the, in this context of love, that bridal honeymoon intimacy and passion, you, have, you still love me, but you're not in love with me like you were when we first began to walk together. Are you guys with me? Church at Ephesus? <laughs> Come on. Are you, are you with me? Look at this. It means fallen. It's the Greek word pipto, P-I-P-T-O. It means to descend from a higher place of bridal love to a lower place of, yeah, I know the Lord. Oh, but your heart doesn't weep when are you 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 don't sound like the the um the beloved in the song of Sol Solomon who said um oh it says um oh it says his kisses are like sweet red wine <laughs> you know that you okay I'm sorry I went somewhere in my head listen Remember, he says, remember, that means exercise your memory, rehearse. You know what that means? That means that when you get in your prayer closet, you sit and you think about how you used to feel about him, how excited you were about church on Sundays, how excited you were about being in the house of the Lord with him and with the people of God. Remember, he's saying, remember, beloved. You know, and he says, you have abandoned it. You, I see me. You, where'd you lay it down? Why you doing all this other stuff, but with no love, no, no, you know, you're, you're endure. You're, 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 it's more of a discipline than a passion. Oh, I can do that. I'm good at discipline. You know, come on. I, you know, I've varsity letters in three different sports in high school, two in college. I know what discipline. I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Discipline. I've got, you know, multiple degrees. I know what discipline, but what about passion for joy? Come on, guys. Okay. Oh, so he's saying, I want you to, this is my issue with you. Well, you, you don't love me like you used to. Like the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, you've descended from bridal love down to just tolerate me. We've been married so long. You used to me, but you don't love me like you did when we first got married. When we were dating, it was like, ooh, I, you, you, you were, I walked in the room and you got butterflies. Come on. Okay, let's keep going. I could work with that for a minute, but we're going to keep going. So he says, repent. That is metanoeo. It means not just to change your mind. It means to change your mindset to another mindset, namely the mind of Christ. Wherever you afie me, wherever you lay down the mind of Christ, you need to pick that bad boy back up pop it back in there and crank the passion back up and let's do this thing from a from a from the love seat of Christ okay all right remember from where you have fallen and do the works you did at first whatever you was doing when you first fell in love with him <laughs> that's what you need to be doing now if not look at this cuz i got 3 minutes look at this he says, if you and I don't do this, he will come. That's Erkoma. That means that he will appear. He's going to come. Oh, man. See, I can't. I ain't going to be able to rush through this part. He says, I will come and I will remove. That's, that Greek word means I will execute. I will perform. I will remove your... Um, lampstand from its place. That's the Greek word topos, your portion, your marked off portion. It is a metaphor for your condition or station that you hail, your opportunity, your power, your occasion for acting, whatever you were doing. He will remove your, the, your lampstand from its place for your portion. Oh man, I, um, He's going to remove the, now, historically, now you have to get this. 
this wasn't a day and age like today. Like I'm sitting in this space. I got my my um, podcast mic, which I'm not using right now. I'm using a mic in my computer. I got a light over here. I turn that off. See what happens. I have lights over here. I got a light on top of my head. All these switches that I can flip light. It wasn't like that then. They had lampstands, little little oil lamps that had a wick. So if you removed the lampstand out of the house, the lights went out. There's there's no light. There's you know. So um, he's saying, "Come on, beloved, you got to get back with me because if you don't." I will come and I will remove, that is the word kineo, K-I-N-E-O. It means, look at this. Now, this is different in terms of removing like we think. And I'm going to say this and then I'm going to have to pick it up next time. I'm sorry. Kineo, it means to stir. But it is a metaphor. It's a Hebraic expression that means a disturbance. I'm going to throw it into commotion. It means a riot. Look at this, guys. He said, if we don't get this first love thing right, I'm going to come. I I will come into your midst. And in his coming, you know, he will start, remove. He's going to throw into commotion. He will start a disturbance that will cause a shifting in our place, in our portion, in our condition, in our opportunity and occasion for acting. That thing you've been doing that you were serving in, it won't feel as good anymore. Oh, man, that's something. Maybe it's just a word for me. Okay. Just think about it. He says, I will start a riot in the place where the anointing used to flow. And suddenly, what was comfortable will not be comfortable. It'll be shaken. Unless you repent. Let's stop right there because I'm out of time. So remind me, I was on repent. (laughs) We'll pick it up and then we'll go into the church at Smyrna. And then we'll look also at Ephesus from uh, the perspective of a love letter from the bride to his bridegroom, from the bridegroom, I'm sorry, a letter from the bridegroom to his bride whose intimacy he misses, okay? Listen, guys, I'm out of time. You have been studying the revelation of Christ, Living Water Livestream Bible Study with Bernardine Wormley Daniels, Soterios Ministries Incorporated. It's always my pleasure to be here with you. Um, I will see you next week, same time. Be careful tomorrow. Snowstorm coming. I hope you can work from home and you're not out on the streets. Um, If this has been a blessing to you, you can um, sow into Soterios through Cash App. It's dollar sign, Dr. Bernie, S-M-I. It goes straight to Soterios Ministries. Also, paypal.me forward slash Soterios ministries or you can go to my app click on the give button you can give that way that's actually the best way to do it and um god will bless you we need your support so we can keep doing what we're doing i'll put all that information in the in the um comments um so you can see it at your leisure see you next time people keep reading keep praying and um ask the holy spirit let's do that in conclusion lord Light a fire in our hearts and ignite a holy passion once again that we might return to bridal love, first love, the love we had for you in the beginning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.